Angel for Humans, episode 13, is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions, but we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. All right, welcome to this week's episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me tonight, Mr. Zach Boniker. Zach, how are you doing, sir? I'm great, Ryan. Thanks for inviting me back. And back from Central America, wandering the world and getting lost countless times, Mr. Amitai Schleyer. Amitai, how are you? I still don't know where I am, but it's good to be here. You know what? It occurs to me, both of you guys have been backpacking off of the continent. Zach, over the pond in London, right? I was in the uh, Lake District of England and Scotland. I got Beautiful. lost in a bog. You got lost in a bog. Amitai, where'd you get lost at? A difficult to reach place that is called Livingston, Guatemala. You can only get there by boat. No roads, no airstrip. Sounds like a blast. And I was out in Washington, D.C., so uh, not quite as uh, tropical or, or interesting, but still quite a bit of fun. So tonight, guys, we've, we've been brainstorming some topics. We're, we're going to do a few different things this episode. We've uh, upgraded in our technology. We've inspected, adapted, and made improvements. We're now able to play some MP3s in the middle of the episode, and we're going to listen to uh, one of Amitai's Agile in Three Minutes here coming up. But first, he's got a topic that he's teed up that I, I think Zach and I found a, a kind of interesting from a, a coaching perspective. It's really, when does a team need coaching and when can a coach exit a team? And so Amitai, if you want to take it from there, let's dig into this one. because so I think it's an important topic that can be both interesting and a little bit uncomfortable. So uh, I'm looking at those words on my screen, when does a team need coaching? And my first thought is kind of semantic, hermeneutic, linguistic. Are those even the right words? Need? Can a team need something? I'm not, I'm not going to go down this path, but that's my first thought. Uh, but let's take it literally first before we deconstruct it. So I'm, I'm coaching. I'm pretty new to coaching. I'm with my first team. I've been with them for several months. I guess my, the basis for this question is we all need coaching in our lives at all times. And only occasionally are we willing and ready to accept it or look for it. Take a subset of that situation and look at when... Uh, a team as part of an organization that is delivering software, because that's what I know how to, how to coach the best. What makes them ready for coaching and what makes them willing to be coached? Amitai, can I start by just exploring for you when, when we say coaching so that I can speak to the same meaning that, 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 that you're referring to. What is coaching to you then? So, for example, what would be the difference between coaching and mentoring? Mentoring means that I have a model in my mind for what you should be. Uh, maybe because you told me that, but I'm trying to help you get toward my mental model of what you should be. Coaching means that my job is to help you figure out who you should be and then figure out what I can do that helps with that or help you figure out a strategy that helps yourself with that. It's sort of back and forth reflection, but it's focused on not the coach. It's focused on the other person. So mentoring maybe for you shares commonalities with teaching, coaching maybe sharing commonalities with facilitation. Yeah, and each of these activities is inevitably coterminous with other activities. Like I'm not always only coaching and I'm not even occasionally coaching but not teaching at the same time. Usually they overlap a lot. Really what we're, I think we're all going to be talking about if we agree is that a person who is willing to move seamlessly between those but coach whenever possible Mm -hmm. when, when is someone receptive to that or a team receptive to that? So do you see a distinction between coaching and consulting? Yeah. Uh, consulting is almost necessarily about the, the readiness. Uh, consulting means we're asking you for advice. That's what you are. You're somebody that provides trusted advice. It can include coaching. That could be, you know, some of the advice could be, hey, do you want a coach? I am one. Let's do that. 
So consulting is kind of about the relationship to begin with. A consultant is hands-on doing some work. So they are in, in the trenches with either developers or with other business analysts, or they're actually doing an activity, whether it's a business an analysis, a market analysis, whether they're you know, like a, a large a acronym, big box consultancy coming in and, and telling you where your opportunities are and digging into the data, or even uh, developers, database programmers, whatever. That's what I see as a consultant. The coach is at that that next level of ab abstraction, watching the interactions, the systems, the ways that, that all of these people are working together and guiding through questions uh, and trying to to move the people around in such ways that they're the most successful. And so that's the distinction that I've drawn between the two, but it's, it's sometimes hard to actually to separate them. Is that I, think, I think if you take the very... Your, your, your first response, I, I think you can very easily fit that into the consultant to say that as a consultant, you're, you're looked at more as the expert. You want to demonstrate your content authority over you know, what it is that, that, that you're asked to be the expert on. So in that role, you, you may spend more time in a mentoring, teaching, maybe even training type of role, um, where a coach by the prior definition clearly isn't asked to be the expert. You're more the catalyst. You're there to help evoke change and to allow or to encourage the self-discovery of, of good change within a desired goal. Interesting. So my, my take on what you were saying, Ryan, was that uh, my definition of coaching is unlike yours, which is that in my case, at least the kind of coaching that I'm doing, I can't imagine a version of it that is successful when I'm not embedded with the people doing the work. I think that I have to be in with them to have credibility with them and have to credibility with myself. Like one of the things I've learned very quickly about myself as a coach is when I do give advice, I don't even believe it myself unless I've practiced it recently. So why should anybody else believe it? Yeah, can so you for serve, me, I have to have my feet on the ground. Can you serve the team without being present? You know, having the presence with them. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think. Will I understand their needs? Will they believe that I understand their needs? All those problems. Yeah, and I don't disagree with your definition. I just think there's. I was merely highlighting that additional role of the of the guiding, and, and the questions and the observing the systems and the people while embedded. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm in no way against that idea at all. Yeah, you have to move in and out of being in the system and observing the system and arranging the system. Yep. With the terms understood, when does a team need coaching? In my opinion, uh, if it's a if it's a team that wants to go beyond just a group of individuals that, you know, th they just do their work, aggregate it, and then, cool, there, there's the outcome, and it's, you know, it's fine. If, if instead the team has expressed a desire to want to be a team, to be accountable to one another, they, they will likely constantly be in a state of conflict um, in a positive way. Um, and so a team moving in that direction, in my opinion, constantly needs coaching. Be, uh, not that they need somebody there asking, you know, saying, here, let me coach you. Um, but they will always need somebody there to help, you know, discover, you know, them, themselves to help improve their own self-awareness, their relationships. Um, and yeah, just to explore what's going on around them and their team environment from different angles. I, I think it just comes up naturally in that type of environment. I think a team needs coaching when it thinks it needs coaching. And then my opinion as an outsider is that a team benefits from coaching or would benefit from coaching when they have not yet mastered the art of learning together. If they have mastered that, they don't need a coach. They, they are coaching themselves. Uh, and if they haven't figured out how we're going, like basically, you know, retrospectives as an internalized practice that they all have all the time. When they have that, they can learn anything they need to learn together when they don't have that internalized yet, then they need some external help until they do. How common do you think that level of self-organization, awareness, and I think that high skill level in conducting retrospectives, how common or how often do you think those three things come together so that a coach wouldn't be required? I'd say almost never. Uh, and that goes for, for me just as well. Uh, I very often need help noticing things that I missed or uh, taking the time to think about things that I didn't take the time. 
uh, even though I have skills to help other people with it, I still need help with it. So probably almost never. Yeah, I think that's the interesting part about the coaching role is that even at the same time as we're working with people, bringing them forward in their agile thinking or, or at least challenging and stretching minds and trying to point out the things that perhaps could be better at the same time we're all on podcasts like this trying to figure out how do we do our stuff better certainly not a, a condescending posture to to assume the role of the coach it's not a, a a better than thou art it's really a i have the ability to see things outside of your current focus and i'd like to help with those and at the same time there are things that i can't focus on that i also need help with when does a team need coaching when the team decides that they need it. And there's actually been some interesting discussions around taking the budgets away from management, putting it into the actual teams and saying, here's money for you to spend when you need help. So this is a fund that you have that, that you can bring a coach in when you feel it's appropriate. But you still, of course, you still have these goals and objectives. And But here's something for you when you decide that, that things aren't going right and you need a correction. I'm still thinking about the idea of, because it's a good answer. I mean, it's a thought provoking answer. Um, that a team needs coaching, you know, when when they they they've decided that they, that they need it, they've realized that they're maybe ready for it. But you know, the the first time I ever saw professional coaching was was getting to you know sit down with Lisa Adkins and and Michael Spade. And I, I mean, I can I can remember a time you know thinking that you know coaching there was a lot of of me telling people, learning, training, you know, almost more like mentoring. And the first time I saw professional coaching in action, seeing a real coaching arc and seeing the co- the questions asked and the engagement and the level of listening, um, I was really kind of blown away. And it, it strikes me as I think about, um, Ty, what you said, I don't know if I would have known I would be ready, you know, as a team member for professional coaching and, and how it looks. And, and really, truly, when, when does a team know that what they need is really true servant leadership Somebody there to, you know, support them and guide them and, and to really do nothing but to be the kind of person to help them explore their thoughts in ways they never have be, before. As a team member, when do you know that that's what you need? I feel like most teams, you know, especially, especially if we talk about a typical team, maybe they're, they're new to Agile, they're, they're probably going to think we need more mentoring. I need more training. I need more teaching. How, how do we break up user stories? And that's not coaching. At least I don't believe so based on our prior meaning, our prior conversation on meaning. Yeah, I'll buy that. It's a it's a bootstrap problem, right? If you don't know, uh, so for instance, if a team doesn't know what it looks like when they have TDD and CI and the ability to move with the business, then they don't know what you talk about when you're talking about that. They don't they don't they can't see the landscape that you can see. Same thing here. Uh, as coaches, we may be uh, among the few people who know what it's like to be coached, and so we may know more than other people do that that's a thing you can ask for and when it's time to ask for it. So. That does seem like a loophole in my answer. Yeah. Uh, well, and 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 I actually think it's a great answer, um, but you know maybe every great answer has a little bit of a loophole to to explore. In a, a recent engagement that I had, I, I had a, a team member who was um, at least to to start was was pretty confrontational. It's kind of like, look, you know, I, I've been here a while. I, I know I know what to do. Um, and and around the end of the engagement, came back and said, so. With this experience with you, I, I really understand what an agile coach is now. And and I I, I think it's 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 priceless. I mean, I, I think it's you know, it's really important for what we're trying to do here with our team. And so I keep feeling like I want to go back to saying, you know, a, a a team that is really just a collection of individuals, they don't have accountability to one another. The challenges that are given to them are are straightforward. They're giving solutions. They're not being asked to solve problems, to use their their, their skills. They're they're not going to need coaching. I, I don't think they 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 need a manager basically they need to make sure that they're doing things right and and moving along. But when we start talking about doing the right things, and we want to get into a team that is accountable to one another, cares about their relationships, um, wants to grow themselves personally and professionally. That's where I think professional coaching comes in and and really can open a lot of doors for a team. I don't think that a team would would ever know that they need it. At least it hasn't been my experience. And and I hope that there is. I hope there's a team out there that is like, yeah, we're ready for it. 
as the coach, we need to make the assessment to say that that is a team that that is ready. That that's a team that's ready to begin a journey towards a real high performing team and just to get away from being a group of individuals. And and starting those coaching arcs and those conversations, I think can can get the momentum going. I don't think they would ask for it though. Uh, yeah, just so my gut feeling. I, I think I agree with you. So if we work backward from teams that could benefit from coaching rarely would self-identify that need. That would seem to imply that the way the teams wind up with coaches is that someone else saw that need and assigned them one. So how do we bootstrap out of that situation when the default response is, why are you pushing this coach at me? No, thank you. An inciting incident. So there's been something that's happened, something that, that has caused the team to, to look up from their, their current focus and to say something's not right. And so that's hard to bootstrap. I mean, that's not something that, that we can recreate. It's not something we could, well, we shouldn't try to cause. But it, it's really been, in my experience, just this incident that has caused everyone to have a collective understanding that we're in trouble or we don't know something or something is not right. And that's typically led to conversations that ended with, all right, we need to get a coach. Who should we bring in? So you're saying when we notice that what we're doing is not working well enough and we can't keep going like this. And when you can no longer ignore it, I think that's the important part. Because I think a lot of times you'll see teams, at least I've seen teams, that are working in a way that's not optimal, even unhealthy, but it's still ignorable. But once that incident occurs or once that observation is made, it's, it's kind of like the idea that there's some things you just cannot unsee. And once that happens, you know, all of a sudden it becomes the, the conversation focuses around, well, how do, we, how do we get to a better place? And I think that's... Yeah. But again, it's not, it's not something you can bootstrap. It's really that it's a realization. It's a, an insightful moment. It's an introspective occurrence. It's, it's something like that that happens that, that it's almost random. Yeah, this, it's, this is actually a really, really core problem for me that you know, I'll, I'll kind of phrase here. And, and please, gentlemen, solve it for me so I can sleep easier. Um, you know, I believe that you know, agile teams really are, are, are human systems, right? They're human systems of work. And so based on that notion, despite our best, you know, intent, teams are, can't really be created. They, they have to be formed. So if these human systems, you know, are at their best when they emerge, when, you know, they're evoked and they emerge organically, then, then how do we even get to the place where, you know, we would come in to start coaching them? You know, uh, it's it's kind of one of those cart and horse problems for me, and and I I don't know the answer. And I, there's there's been times where I've come in and worked with teams, and 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 it it hasn't been a really great experience for a lot of the, the reasons that the, that we've discussed. And then other times, it's just been right. They've been in the right place, you know, and and I don't know how they got there. I don't know what led to that. I just I, I can see it. It was there, and and we did great things. Uh, so how so how do you set that up? You know, again, it kind of goes back again to the original question. You know, does a coach, does a team ask for it? I've heard conversations around hiring, you know, in the agile space that, hey, you want a team coach? Just kick it down to the team. Get some candidates out there and let the team interview. But then again, that goes back to saying, <laughs> you know, if, if what the team needs, if they're new, they may think that they need a trainer when that's really not what they need. And so they hire somebody who just seems like the expert and tells them what to do without really learning and growing. So you don't know what you don't know. And that's always going to be, I, I'm sure there's a law or something that's been named around that, that uh, or some kind of model. But Ripley's law? It is Ripley's law. You don't know what you don't know. <laughs> but I think it was Yogi Berra saying, whatever it is, I, I mean, I've had this experience. I think we all have. I mean, I've talked about going to Agile Coach Camp a few years back as being very proficient in Scrum. And so it's a framework I'm very familiar with. It's one that I understand very well. But surrounded by coaches... You know, I, and we're, we're talking about, you know, Don Gray, George Dinwiddie, uh, Esther Derby was there, Diana Larson. These are the, the top coaches in our field. And I knew nothing. And it's one of those, those moments, those incidents where you just sit back and go, I have to fix this. And so it's a, first of all, I was, I, I was forced to confront the fact that I did not understand how to coach people. And then secondly, I had to decide to accept that that realization. And then finally, after reaching out to, you know, Don and, and George and some others, getting coached up on, on, the, on the gaps that I had, it was a decision to do that. It wasn't manufactured. It was just, I was confronted with a truth that, uh, that I did not understand. 
certain things about coaching people and I had to I had to decide to make that fix. And so I think teams and that's why I go back to I think teams will get confronted with we don't know how to meet this expectation or goal and we need to find a way to get there. Unfortunately, I think it's an external observation most of the time, right? I think Zach you were going into it's an externally observed occurrence and then it's a decision made outside the team. So management sees that the team is quote unquote failing and looks to bring in someone, you know, more than 50 miles away because if you're within 50 miles of the company's headquarters you're an idiot, but if you're greater than 50 miles away you're a genius and you can come in and help the team and it goes on like that. Exposing people to high quality content like Agile Coach Camp can manufacture those moments or at least expose them to the idea that there is a a next level to aim for. But as far as teams having that awareness, I just, I don't know how as a coach you would go about making that happen on a consistent basis. I think there's an idea that ties together what you both just said. And that is, Ryan, when you realized at that coach camp that you had much further to go, how did you decide in the absence of knowledge how to proceed, how you were going to proceed? Because you did decide, right? So how did you figure out what you were going to do about it? I asked for help. So I did not know how to proceed. I made the decision that I would be open to coaching from others. So I went and asked Don and, and, and George and, and Aaron Copel and another and a number of friends just what do I need to do to improve? And they provided paths and, you know, guys like Don and George and, you know, Woody Zool and they give so much of their time. It's a very generous community. And so it was, you know, they made it painless. But it was one of those where I just had to decide to ask and admit that I didn't know. That's a pretty good strategy. So the reason I think this ties together, and then I'll give the mic back to you, Zach. We always act in the absence of complete knowledge. No matter how expert we think we are in a given context, uh, there's more that we don't know in that context, and there's plenty of context we know zilch. And so uh, whatever you did to cope is a lot like, say, for example, a team not knowing what it should get help with does hire a trainer and say that they decide that, that having you know, techniques blatted at their faces turns out not to be what they needed. How else were they going to learn that? I mean, how did we learn that? We learned by having that and deciding it wasn't the right thing. So maybe that's exactly what they're ready for. And maybe, you know, maybe they have to wait a little longer to get where they're going, but they know exactly why they're going where they're going. Yeah, exact, exactly what, what happened there, right, is, is what we see happen all the time when, when you know, good leaders and just you know, good, good solutions to problems come up is when we kind of define the problem. You define it in your head, I need this knowledge. You kind of surrendered to it. I can't do it on my own. And you elevated the problem to people and sought help. You said, I don't know. Help. And that's, that's, that's a great place to be. <laughs> that's where that's wonderful expert problem. level right there. Yeah. yeah. So let's say that we, we get the coach in. When can the coach leave? Is that when the, when the check bounces? <laughs> <laughs> when we get fired. Yeah, when the contract comes. When you get fired. <laughs> um, you know, I, that's, it's, a good, it's a really great question. I think that to some degree, it's a good time for a coach to exit when a team makes a decision that the effort needed to, to be, you know, an agile team, to have working relationships, to, to be, you know, uh, uh, in conflict and, and continuously improve, seek better and, and ever better standards of, of, of software and to improve themselves. When they, they, they say, you know, that it's not worth it to us. We would just like to type in some code, be told what to do, so to speak, and that's their comfort level. That's a good time for the coach to leave because that's the wrong type of um, person that the team needs. The team, unfortunately, needs more, I would argue, needs more management rather than coaching. Um, I've, I've yet to have a situation <clears throat> where I've worked with teams where good things were happening. We, we were seeing real teamwork, seeing a real team form, you know, coaching, professional coaching was, was doing what, what, you know, we, we want it to do. Um, I've yet to have a team say, we're, we're, we're good. Um, I, I, I can think back on, uh, the mob at, at Hunter and I, you know, knew that there, I know that, that when Woody left the team, you know, even though that, that, that the mob there was so self-sufficient and they were doing such amazing things, there was still that level of, but it's nice to have, a coach there to have somebody like, like Woody be there for us that, you know, when he left, they were able to cope, but they didn't ask for it, you know, and I haven't had a team say, you know, really great team say, you know what, I think we're good now. I think we're good on our own. Um, this, this isn't what, what we want and we need. Um, and it, and it was, it felt 
felt that it was right because what I was doing was the wrong sort of, of guidance that they were looking for. There's a few things to unpack there. I think the first is the coach being aware of when it's time to go, right? So observing that the team is self-sufficient, perhaps it'll be a little painful, they'll have to stretch, but, but it is that right time. And I think the other part is recognizing when people are not receptive or who have not given permission to be coached. Yeah, yeah. They're, they've even even not having been well well either having you know not been given permission or have come to the decision that you know the 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 look of the team it, they want to some, they want to take it back to just more of an individual level right they they want to reject the idea of like a, a a coach team relationship and just go back to you know roles just to your comment about people wanting to go back to the individual role do you think it's a failure of systems the companies have not eliminated the incentives to be to become a team. That there are still HR practices where forced ranking on annual performance reviews and the bottom five percent fired. So of course you don't want to be a team. Or annual bonuses paid out on individual contribution and accomplishment. So of course you don't want to be a team. Or or things like that that or individuals being recognized and for the work accomplishments instead of the actual team. Do you think those things are leading to that, or is it really just a natural desire to be? an individual i've seen teams emerge in um hierarchies or or systems of work that were very you know performance driven you know bonuses be the individual contributor that sort of thing um I, i've seen teams work through that um but i think without question <laughs> that doesn't help <laughs> that's not going to make a coach's job you know any easier especially if a company is saying you know we want to transform we want to be team centric we want to start to have systems of work that are informed by agile values and principles that that sort of you know behavior doesn't encourage that that outcome for sure. So we've talked about when does a team need coaching? When can a coach exit? The difficulties of first of all recognizing that moment, and then also getting in the door. What what happens when the coach goes in, works with a team or company and organization that has recognized a need for a coach, but the team itself has no interest in agile, or and they have no belief in the idea that an agile transformation could help them in any way, shape, or form. So my read on that is, uh, and this ties into something we were, we were getting at earlier too, if teams don't seem to self-select that they need a coach, then that implies that when they get a coach, someone else selected it and selected the coach, then this is the kind of thing that can happen, is that they're being told to, to transform in a certain way, and they didn't ask for that. So maybe we ought to think about uh, if we're stuck guessing on teams' behalf when they should have a coach. And it seems like a high percentage of the time we or upper management that buys coaches is looking for a good guess. Then that's how we need to think about it. It's a hypothesis. This team might benefit. Let's try it. Uh, Maybe we hedge that bet somehow. Maybe we just assume that it succeeds or fails. I think one thing that we have to admit when we're trying to manipulate a human system, and that's what assigning a coach to a team is, is manipulating a human system, is that it might not do what you want. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's one thing. Uh, but then, you know, individually, when I land in a team like that, now what? They didn't ask for me. I don't have their permission. What can I offer them that is of value to them? Because clearly it hasn't been explained already, right? We think there's value. Whoever hired us in thinks there's value. If they don't think there's value there, they're right. There won't be. Yeah, the the human system is changed not by, you know, direct action, but by observation and insight. So yeah, just just like you said, Amatai, if you if you actually have a team that you know is is you know they're growing, and they get a direct action that seems to contradict or at least doesn't resonate with them, yeah, it's not going to have the the desired effect. At least not in the same way that pointing out the observation or giving them insight would allow them to respond in a way that's meaningful to them. Yeah. So, so what do you do? I, I mean, if you're put in that place, um, I, I think the first thing you can do is definitely step back into a coaching stance, understand, you know, what your values are, um, and then basically make yourself vulnerable to the team and say, here, here I am. Um, I recognize that you know. The, I recognize that that this may not be the same thing that, that that you're looking for. What are you looking for? What do you see my value, or what you know? Where where can we start to to build trust, to build a relationship, and then we can see where it goes from there. 
Um, but that's, yeah, it's tricky. I think you just have to make yourself vulnerable to, to start. I mean, as a servant leader, you need to put yourself in a, in a position to serve them first. And, and maybe they just want you to be quiet for a while. Maybe you have to you're do not, that. Yeah, you're not obligated to use me, but you're obligated to let me sit in this room. <laughs> yeah. And hopefully we can figure out what's mutually beneficial. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, that sounds so, you know, I can, I can hear probably some listeners right now being like, yeah, but, but we've got a team. We're trying to run a business here, you know. But, you know, again, it, it goes back to that really fundamental belief of, of, of what type of system of work you're creating. If we're really trying to create a human system of work, which has this potentially infinite ability to solve complex problems, Stepping in there and and demanding things is is just not going to invoke the change that you're looking for. The the insight, the observations of of who they are and what they are, help them make meaningful change on their own. It's that that process of self discovery again. Coercion versus invitation. I went down and visited with the Agile Indie Group uh, last week. Gave a talk on management and in and their role in a transformation and how all of that works out. And one of the areas that really resonated and caused a lot of questions and a, almost a moment of pause was the idea of coercion and how transformations led by a coercion will typically fail. I don't think people resist change and I think they resist being told what they have to do. And the change itself may not be so bad with the fact that they didn't have a say in it and they didn't get to build that, that change and be a part of it is where a lot of the pushback comes from. And it's a, it's a hard lesson for, for managers to take because, you know, I'm one of them, right? So I, I have a role there where I observe problems and I want to inflict help all over that problem and, and make it go away. But that doesn't work. It's not the team's solution. And it, time and time again, that, that realization has proven to me that, that I can't just go in and fix it, even though I'd love to. It, it's got to be a, a joint discussion, a joint solution. And when Agile is forced onto people, we're violating that principle and we're, we're courting failure almost at every turn. Yeah, I believe if you had a team of Ryans in your case, you know, you had five or six Ryan Ripley's all on the team, you could probably direct them with those solutions really <laughs> effectively. Um, but I've, I've yet to experience, you know, something similar in my engagement. So the, the outcome you describe is the same. As soon as you try to come with an agenda to people who want to use their, their, their skills and who believe in themselves, yeah, that providing the solution kind of, kind of backfires more often than not. If you ever walk into an engagement and there's five of me sitting there staring back at you, Quit, run. fire, <laughs> say, I can't take run. it. Run. Here's what you say. You say, five Ripley's, believe it or not, <laughs> and then you run away. Thank you, everyone. And that will conclude our, that was great. <laughs> We're going to burn this one down. So something that I say, uh, I have said in a couple different episodes of Agile in Three Minutes is whatever Agile might mean, it's the opposite of telling people what to go do. And I, yeah. I don't have a better definition other than it's the opposite of that. That's where the coach lives, right? That's where, that's where we should be on the influence side rather than the coercion. It's, Even uh, if they were uh, willing to receive coercion and act on it, there are a couple kinds of messages that are undermined by that kind of behavior, and one of them is the Agile message. Yes. Just the, by, by virtue of the medium through which the message was conveyed, there goes the message. I think we have to be careful, too, because I, something that I've, I've, I've observed in transformations that I have either led or been involved in, self-organization will not feel safe initially to most people. It is a scary concept. And so when, when we come in to do this kind of coaching and, and we start throwing out these kind of terms, that can turn people off from this process. It really does scare people to think that we're responsible for ourselves and accountable for ourselves. And, and now we're going to have to come up with all of this on our own. And what are we going to do when it fails? And someone's going to get fired. Someone's going to get blamed. Bad things are going to happen. And and really walking a lot of that back for a team that really doesn't want you there in the first place, what a daunting challenge. Yeah, and that's, I, it, when, when you say that, right, I'm, the idea of the, you know, in, in Agile, your, your self-organizing teams and, and empowerment and all that, you know, calling it something that, you know, if, if it's like coercion, you know, it's an instruction. I, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe you disagree, but it's, to me it seems like empowerment and the idea of self-organizing is it, really almost a fundamentally human thing. 
So to have the instruction that you need to be a self-organizing team, I, I don't know, what does that tell you about the organization before that, that demand came, that, that we're, we're a depowering organization? You know, we want to take away your, your humanness. So, you know, I think you need to probably have a frank conversation with people in that sense to say, you know, is this even something that resonates with you? Do you understand that you have that ability? And, and I, I think it's probably possible that people could say no for very human reasons because people defend bad systems all the time. I mean, especially if they fear, just like you said, it's a, the loss of a job or something like, um, you know, if, if, if their livelihood is dependent on that system or, or they believe that what they're doing is good, they'll defend a bad system even if it's causing them harm. Yeah, it, it's, it's a human problem, right? We will stick with bad things because it's, it's a known quantity. It's, it's something that, that we've learned to live with, and, and it's until it becomes painful or painfully obvious that it's bad, there's not a lot of, of push to change. So it's yet another one of those coaching challenges that, that bright guys like the two of you get to tackle, and fortunately someone like me who's an insider, a, uh, an, an FTE, as you guys like to put it, uh, it's not so much my problem. <laughs> Congratulations. I just get to tell- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this actually came up. Is that why it feels familiar? Feels familiar. We actually had this conversation today, and I answered your question with, it's a human question, or we have more comfort with the familiar, even if the familiar is hurting us. People embrace those systems because it's familiar, and they know it, even if it's bad, because it could be worse. Yeah. And that's, I, and that's probably a statement on, on our, our current orgs today, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's just how... And what, what sweet justification, I think, for the idea of an expert, or I shouldn't even say expert, um, a catalyst, right? Somebody who can evoke change through conversation by getting people to explore, self-discover, you know, meaningful, you know, change while, you know, still being, while, while, while still being guided, um, as opposed to somebody who just comes in and demands, you know, change. So this is, this is what an agile team looks like, for example, or, or this is, this is how you do it. You have to do scrum. This is what you do. It looks just like this. Um, yeah, I think you you know, that, that, that sort of activity plays exactly on that human behavior, the, the, the human problem. And again, I circling back why I think teams need coaches and, uh, you know, why professional coaching is, is a, a pretty powerful thing. We've had some input from Twitter. Neil Killick has reached out all teams need a coach, according to him. This provides a challenge for orgs that want to change to a coaching model, though. Nice insight from Neil, and we appreciate the tweet from him. I think we've covered this, guys, and I'm, we've left it, I think, at it's a very difficult question. It's individuals and interactions, and how do you... And, and in this case, there isn't a process or a tool that solves this. I think it's a one-on-one interaction. It's, uh, I think Neil's actually right, too, here, that, that all teams do need a coach, it's going to be a challenge for organizations to provide that. I think the companies and organizations that want to be high performing will eventually realize that coaching is a requirement to that. I've never seen an NBA team make it far without a coach on the bench and, or any professional sporting team. And there's a reason that they're there, even for the professionals. Uh, LeBron James does not need uh, coaching per se to be an amazing player, but to get him working with five other people well and to make sure the fundamentals of, of the basketball that they're playing is correct, that coach is needed. It's definitely an interesting topic. I did want to transition into one of my favorite podcasts other than this one. So Amitai is also a publisher. He's a creator, or the creator, of Agile in Three Minutes. We're going to play one of these podcasts. It's the simplest podcast that could possibly work. So it's a agile advice and thoughts and insights in three minutes or less. We're going to play episode eight for you. And this one's titled care. Amitai, do you want to tee anything up here before we play it? Uh, I hope you care enough to listen to it. And thanks for the intro, Ryan. Well done. Yep. Well done. This is agile in three minutes, the simplest podcast that could possibly work. My name is Amitai Schleier. How can others tell what matters to you? While developing software, when we feel anything at all, our feelings might be dominated by fear or pain arising from delivery pressure, complex problems, unclear solutions, judgmental teammates, managers, and customers, missed deadlines, or bugs. It takes patience and discipline, 
but we can arrange to feel differently. The primary antidote to the fear and pain of being wrong is to care. To not let the fear or the pain force us to detach from the struggle and guard ourselves, but to continue to care with our whole hearts and seek more effective ways to care with our whole minds. I'm drawing a distinction here between feeling that I care and being skilled at caring. To take effective action, it's not usually sufficient to feel that I care about the outcome. Still, it's probably necessary. Why would I bother to devise an effective strategy for something I don't feel is important to anyone? So the feeling is an important first step. But around the world, despite our best intentions, people often seem to be disappointed in what they've built or received. They may have cared, but it's hard to tell that they hadn't been careless. Caring means making an effort. If you're careful about meeting a deadline, you'll make efforts to do so. If you care more about a deadline than about the folks who are working to meet it, you'll make more effort about the deadline than about the people. Turns out, though, that you're more likely to meet deadlines if those people care about meeting them, too. If we care out of fear, we can't sustain our best work and might not stick around for another deadline. If we care out of love, we can, and just might. When we make an effort for people... That's love. I've cared deeply, sometimes with skill, for many people I've worked with. And I'm always trying to care more deeply with more skill for more people. I might choose to feel bashful for having bothered to care in certain working environments, but it's in those environments, ruled by fear and pain, that I've needed to care and be cared for the most. To continue to care is an act of personal bravery and sometimes defiance, that can have tremendous impact. When we feel cared for, when we know we matter to others, we can care effectively about nearly anything. This has been Amitai Schleyer delivering an increment of Agile in 3 Minutes, the simplest podcast that could possibly work. And that's why I absolutely love your podcast, Amitai because you've managed to pick the one episode prior to us talking that would tie into everything we just talked about. How do you do it? Uh, I cannot reveal my secrets. A three-minute discussion. So it's not the typical podcast. You've gotten a lot of excellent feedback. I know people like Tobias Mayer has uh, reached out on Twitter Twitter with a lot of uh, praise for it. I know that some others... I'm sure you can, can fill us in on some more of the feedback that you've gotten, but just a, a great amount of feedback. It seems to be resonating with a lot of people. What goes into putting together that three-minute script each week? Dramatic answer is it's more difficult than you imagine. <laughs> uh, it's, it's difficult. It takes. I have to bring uh, all of my attention and energy for uh, somewhere between two and four hours to get the script just right. Um, and that's that's motivated by my desire not to waste a second of anyone's time. What mainly goes into it at the, first begin at the, at the beginning is that I, I scratch out on a topic more than enough words, and then I look for the connective tissue. I look for the ideas that I need to make sure that I connect. I try to go you know, up a level, down a level, uh, look for a little wordplay if there is some, look for other meanings other than the usual meanings. Because uh, each episode is one word. It's about one word. It's about one idea and things that bounce off of it. So I'm looking for a result that is very dense, almost fractal, uh, and that I, I can't predict what a listener will come away with having, you know, which particular thought will have been provoked that they use for that day. But I hope that one will. And so I want to have enough little thorns coming off of there that one of them catches you. So there's, there's a little bit of writing and there's a lot of editing and a lot more editing and a little bit more editing after that. And after that, it's a really easy production process, but it's the editing that takes the most time. Yeah, just some of the feedback you've gotten, you know, poetic gems, insightful, concise, and elegant. That's Tobias Mayer, made me tear up. That's Diane Zajak Woody, stunningly awesome, and it only takes three minutes. Ruth Mallon, much more digestible than traditional length podcasts. That's Aaron Griffith, and a great series of micro podcasts on agile topics, high signal for noobs. That's Michael Hill. I think you've, you've definitely hit a chord with people in a very positive way. 
your latest one, episode 16, Connect, is, I think, brilliant. I hope people go out to Agile in 3 minutes.es. We'll put a link in the show notes, but uh, I hope you guys go out there, subscribe, and listen. Amitai is dropping some amazing knowledge in a three-minute time box week after week. Each one of them has led me to, to sit down and write for a number of hours and, and get some drafts of blog posts and really stimulated some thought. And so I'm, I'm so appreciative that you do the podcast, which is why I really wanted to make sure that we introduced it to this audience and, and got it out there because people should be listening to this. Well, it's tremendously gratifying to, to hear this kind of feedback and to, to have you share an episode on this show. It's, it's hard work, and so it, it really helps me decide to keep doing it when I hear feedback like that. It's an entirely different listening experience. You know, it's, it's just three minutes, like you said, but at least when I listen to them, I almost have to sit down, kind of get myself in a mental state of saying, I'm going to take three minutes and just let the message wash over me because it is dense, like you said. It's awesome stuff. It's a totally different experience than our podcast. So thank you for doing it. It, it really fits a, you know, it fits in a space that I think is needed out there um, in the pod, the, the the library of podcasts that are available to to us. Guys, I think we've hit our time box. We have our one hour time box. This is uh, agile in one hour, or as we like to call it, agile for humans. But there are some things that, that we wanted to cover real quick. A good friend of the show, a past guest, uh, Victor Benashi has a Kickstarter out there, Zach, that's pretty exciting. I think you've had a chance to to interact with this product at least a little bit that uh, that he's putting out there. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could, could go into that a little bit for us. I think what he's doing is amazing with these Agile coaching cards. I'm very excited for him. It's a really neat idea. He's getting a lot of great feedback. I think this uh, Kickstarter could be really interesting. Yeah, so so Victor is one of the you know close colleague of mine in Southern California, and he was one of the first... Um, in the area to start a an agile networking group, a learning community um, using the Lean Coffee format. So over the course of two, three years, he's been collecting the best topics from the meetups, from these uh, these Lean Coffee sessions um, that you know spurn the best conversations, and he's compiled them into a really professional, really high quality deck of cards. They just they look just like playing cards, and they are simple as you know. Each card has a thought-provoking, agile-related question to ponder. Um, what's beautiful about them is that I, I experimented with this deck. <clears throat> I brought Vic down to my, uh, my agile coffee, my lean coffee group in San Diego. We pulled out a deck, and we just played with them. We played games with them. We had conversations, and we had a blast. And it, started, it, got, it got me thinking, the possibilities here with this deck of cards are infinite. I mean, I can imagine setting the stage with the retrospective, breaking the ice with a new team, just at a you know a convention like Agile 2015, and just say, "Hey, you, hey, what do you think about this topic?" And randomly pulling out a, de I mean, it, it, they're really really cool. Um, so he's got a Kickstarter going. Um, anybody who helps fund the, the the Kickstarter, he's got various levels, but you know you can get your hands on some of his prototype decks. He's already got two of them um, generated, with a third that he's planning with your questions. If you want to, you know, be a contributor. Um, check it out because I, it's been a while since something is, you know, an idea as simple as this has got me really thinking about, I've got some fun ideas. I think I could try, you know, in the workplace and, and, you know, even just with colleagues, um, it's a great idea and I can't, I can't wait to see where it goes. So I think what we're going to do with the cards on this show, Zach and Amitai, we'll see if you guys are open to this, but I think we're just going to start pulling a card at the end and doing a quick five minute lean coffee simulation on a topic from the deck. Yeah. Nice. And they're fun topics. And they're fun topics, far better than anything the three of us could come up with. So I think we're going to start pulling a card at the end, spend five minutes on it, and just spin through the deck of cards over the next you know, 40 or 50 episodes. Hopefully we make it that far. But uh, I'd like to start doing that as a segment and just keeping the this product front of mind. You know, There's no kickback incentive. There, you know, Zach and I and Amitai, we're not getting anything out of this except for the sheer enjoyment and fulfillment from helping Victor with his, uh, with his endeavor. Such a great product, such a simple and great idea. We'll have a link in the show notes. We're just uh, really excited about this, and I think many of the people that, list, that are listening to this will be too. We are at, the, at our time box. Is there anything that you guys would like to plug? Is there anything that you have coming up, anything that you read recently that, that got you thinking that, that you'd like to throw out before we, we call it a night? Go ahead, I'm a uh, I've got a plug, which is that uh, another way to support Agile in three minutes is to suggest an idea for a topic or any other kind of improvement or anything that one of the episodes makes you think of 
or any other feedback you'd like to provide. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. That's great. Zach, how about you? We covered where I wanted to plug, which was VIX, you know, Kickstarter. So on, on September 10th in the Irvine area, actually at the University of California at Irvine, you know, the mascot is the anteaters. Right? Um, Agile Open Southern California will be taking nice. place. Um, so this is an annual uh, open space conference where we get together some of the brightest and most interesting people in the Agile community in Southern California. And we extend the invitation to everyone. That includes you, Ryan, Amitai, come join us. Uh, but it's a two-day open space conference. It's it's a blast. Um, I don't know if there's still tickets uh, that are open. I think there's a few that are available. Um, so go ahead and you know just get on there, Google uh, Agile Open Southern California. It'll take you right to their link. Um, and register. Come check it out. Tons of fun. And I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Do you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode or a comment about something we discussed tonight? If so, we'd love to hear from you. Visit AgileAnswerMan.com and click on Ask a Question to send us an email or record a message that could end up on the show. You can also reach out on Twitter, at Ryan Ripley, or in the comments section of this blog post. That's going to do it for this episode of Agile for Humans. Thanks for listening, and have a great night. Um, 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 um.